world in a sense that if you sed uh, sedimentary chemist and if you're working on carbonates, uh, your most typical carbonate uh, for Earth history would be at zero values. So you kind of you borrow a little bit of changes here and there, uh, like uh, in Phanerozoic you get maybe to plus five. Really, rarely you get to plus eight values, but most of the time it's close to zero. And interesting, you go back in time and you get into Archean, and as far as we can go back in time into Archean, and you get the same carbonates with zero carbonates to values. So, which is kind of puzzling because uh, if you think about it, uh, life was getting complex. Uh, we go from uh, very primitive cyanobacterial bacteria, uh, primary producers in the ocean, we go to mammoths, we go to humans, we go to a uh, huge increase in uh, food chains. So we kind of uh, go from a primitive society where people were only uh, sort of producers of their own food to more complicated societies where people are capitalizing on each other and, uh, and that's a uh, repeating pattern in biology. But it would, should have some impact in terms of burial of organic carbon. And uh, carbon isotopes and carbonates reflect this burial of organic carbon. And they don't show us change. So you can pick up a stone 2.7 billion years, and as far as its carbon isotope composition, it would be the same as carbonate from a Florida uh, carbonate bank in modern ocean. So why is it the case? And it's one of the questions that is uh, still not completely answered. We really don't know it. But it's an observation that um, we cannot neglect and we need to deal with it. But what is interesting, you go through Archean time, you arrive to uh, 2.3 uh, billion years, and suddenly you get to this carbonate of values that go to plus 10. And in some cases, we go even higher to plus 15, plus 17. Um, I found some values that went to plus 28. <coughs> so what happened here to biogeochemical carbon cycle that it went for a while, uh, kind of wild and crazy to these values? And, uh, and it, from what we know, it lasted for a relatively long time. It lasted at least between 2.22 and something like 2.11, 2.06. So it's about 150 million years. It's a huge time interval. And this carbonized of values go to this uh, very high values. So if you take a carbon uh, record in a, or interpretation of carbon record in a traditional way, uh, it implies high burial of organic carbon. And high burial of organic carbon uh, basically implies that large amount of oxygen released into atmosphere. So if we calculate like how much oxygen would go to atmosphere, it would be an incredible amount of oxygen. Uh, so where this oxygen would go? So now a question would be uh, not so much like what led to production or a release of oxygen, Rather, the question is where this oxygen was consumed. And that's a question we will try to address. So just uh, to emphasize uh, what we see here, uh, there is uh, about 150 million years of extremely high burial rate of organic carbon with accompanying a release of oxygen into atmosphere. And when it drops down to values that are uh, so familiar to us, close to zero values. So uh, to, to sort of deal with these questions, uh, we will be jumping between Canada and uh, South Africa, sort of trying to combine the records. And uh, South Africa is a uh, sort of excellent uh, area to study this because there uh, uh, has been a lot of mining. We're at drill course uh, covering succession. It's a very well exposed area, so you can actually go and see rocks. We're not tropically worried, so we're reasonably well preserved. 
and there is a, a relatively continuous record there. So what I will be presenting here, uh, uh, some data from this eastern part of Transvaal Basin uh, for the so-called Deutschland Formation, uh, some data for carbonates and shells, uh, some data from uh, this area where sh organic rich shells were deposited, and I will be linking it to most uh, sort of western part of this basin. Okay, so uh, so the first unit, uh, the Deutschland formation, and don't worry too much about names because uh, obviously we are not familiar to you. Uh, I'll try kind of to present it in a way that uh, to uh, to de-emphasize uh, names and emphasize implications, but. Uh, what is important here is where this formation sits. And it sits above the iron formation, which was dated uh, at 2.48 billion years. Uh, so basically, it's a time interval where things started to go to change. It's a time above this uh, 2.45, 2.45. Uh, uh, 5 billion years age. And uh, the first glacials, we, uh, there is a glacial at the base of this unit, but there is another one higher up. So it's a unit sandwich between two glacial in early part of Cretazoic. And what we find here that in the lower part of the succession, carbon ester value is negative. And if you're familiar with Neoproterozoic, that's what you find in neoproterozoic so-called cap carbonates above uh, glacials. But what is more important for us in upper part of the unit, we find this highly positive values up to plus eight. And why it's important for us? Because it's the oldest unit to record this uh, perturbations in uh, biogeochemical carbon cycle. So it's older than uh, what people typically call Lamagundi event, starting at 2.22. Uh, so now we jump, uh, as I promised you, across the ocean to Canada. And what uh, we have in Canada, a number of basins that uh, sort of uh, develop uh, around the area called Great, uh, Great uh, Lakes. And uh, in Canada, we have <coughs> It's called Huronian Supergroup, and it's very well preserved sort of around the Sudbury. And if you go to Upper Peninsula, Michigan, uh, it's called uh, Animiki uh, Group, and it's extend from uh, sort of Michigan to Wisconsin to Minnesota. And uh, we can see where sort of uh, successions with this, uh, but also have polypreterizoid glaciers. So in Canada, in Coronian supergroup, there are three glacials shown here. And this is really uh, a neat succession for this time interval. So unfortunately, it doesn't have much of carbonates uh, or much of organic shells. But otherwise, it's really encompassing changes that happen during this time. And why do I say so? Uh, well, because in the low part of this succession, uh, in Makinenda formation, that was area in early days what was mined for uh, uranium for detrital plaza deposits. So here at the base of succession you find detrital pyrite, detrital uraninite, but in early days was economical enough to build mines and mine it until Athabasca was found and it went out of business. And But fortunately for us, uh, who are not concerned about making money, but rather than using them, uh, it's created enough geological knowledge that we can now utilize for understanding the super environments. And then, what, uh, what's the age? Uh, at the base of succession, you have this uh, volcanics, and unfortunately, we, we are not as well dated as I would like it, but it's around 2.45 billion years. So, above it, uh, atmosphere was still anoxic, we see this detrital 
uh, pyrites uranulites. At the base of succession, you see multiple pyrite souls. Uh, so people who are uh, uh, sort of uh, have a questions about pyrite souls, they can read all these uh, multiple papers about uh, pyrite souls developed on volcanics or on granites. And uh, there are uh, pretty big issues on this uh, that kind of work worth to look on it, but uh, the reason it's important for us because these parasols uh, are reducing. They suggest that oxygen at that time was relatively low. And I mean, you can argue like how low it was, but it's low. And so we start moving up from succession, we get to the first glacial event, so something happened to Earth system, like uh, something initiated these glacials. Uh, we go higher up in section, we get into a second glacial event, uh, and above it, uh, basically the only appearance in this succession of carbonates. Uh, so uh, the only really large uh, carbonate developed here with negative carbonates of values, again, similar to what we find in cap carbonates in near Proterozoic, above this near Proterozoic snowball earth events. And when, and when high up, the last glacial, which is really massive, like these pictures I showed with big boulders, uh, twice or three times my head, they are all from this <coughs> large glacial. And you step above it, and suddenly you are in different world. You arrived to red beds, to sulfide evaporites, uh, to carbonates with highly positive carbonates to values, no detrital uraninite anymore, no detrital pyrite anymore. Uh, so the world kind of changed uh, to a better uh, sort of things. So, and all of this you can basically walk and you can uh, see this transition over like maybe uh, five, 10 kilometers, depending in what part of the basin you are. So, uh, if you cross to Michigan, the uh, United States didn't get uh, a full record of that time. Not, uh, you cannot get everything, right? But they got at least something comparable to upper part of the succession. So again, there is a glacial here. And what is, uh, I forgot to mention, what is really interesting about this last glacial, you get into this kilometer thick sandstorm which is very unusual sandstone because it's very mature, it's very clean sandstone. It's like 95% pure quartz. Uh, so basically you go from this very cold climate uh, where CIA, if you would believe in it, <laughs> would be, <I'm> uh, <laughs> would be uh, showing cold climate and suddenly you get into this very clean quartzite with uh, uh, sort of with all field spa plagiarism gone. Like so, what what happened? Uh, so people talk about this extreme greenhouse conditions here that led to uh, sort of uh, uh, intense chemical weather, and yet it's a very shallow water environment. So you you are not. Uh, so you have this balance between accommodation space uh, to deposit this sandstone and weathery uh, to bring this clean parts. And so the same in Michigan. And in fact, if we go to any continent of this age, uh, uh, we find this pretty clean quartzite. Like if you uh, go to Brazil, uh, you also find the same clean quartzite uh, uh, Circadinga formation in Minas and uh, but, uh, so uh, so uh, originally Grant Young and Nesbitt we were arguing that it's a response to this very intense chemical weathering in aftermath of glaciation. But what we realize now that it's typical for this uh, time interval rather than specifically about glacier, and that's kind of have relevance to the story that will unroll. And so when we have again this positive carbonates and shifts. So uh, I will present a few da data for this succession. Okay, so, uh, so here's, a, here's this uh, 
a corner dolomite. Uh, don't worry about names again, but it's about glacial, and people correlated traditionally about the last glacial. Uh, and uh, if you go here, uh, you have this, what, 600 meters of carbonates with stromatolites, with sulfite evaporites, uh, all kind of sedimentary structures you can see here. But if you are a geochemist, uh, what you would pay more attention to is to this steady signal at plus eight per mil. So it's like, uh, uh, it's a very high values for carbonates and we're steady. I mean, we cannot say like how many million years it took to deposit this sedimentary succession. Probably like maybe 10, maybe 30, maybe 50 million years. We don't, probably not 50 million years. It would be too long for 50 million years. But uh, at least over duration of this succession, carbon cycle was steady at these heavy values and was not uh, sort of returning to zero values. So that's a, one of the question, like what drives this high burial rate of organic carbon? What is responsible for it at that time? Okay, so now I switch gears and I present uh, some data uh, on geochronology. Uh, because I remember I mentioned that uh, we have this 230 million years, but we cannot break it because we don't have ages. And now, uh, with the help from Gertrude Rasmussen, uh, we kind of started to break this time interval, uh, or date inside this time interval, and it has some implications, and I think uh, it has some implication in terms of how potentially things can be dated in the world. So, uh, first uh, data that were produced before us, uh, so this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, so just to position you, uh, I will be talking about this unit, glacial unit in Michigan and uh, sandstone above it. And uh, so in, uh, in this glacial unit in Michigan, uh, they did uh, detrital zircon analysis. And they came up with this 2.31 uh, billion years detrital zircon, which was quite unusual because uh, we typically, at that time, uh, it wasn't common for North America. It's actually not common for any continents. Uh, sort of this uh, age group. Uh, uh, here's another one from, I think uh, that would be uh, also Enchantment Lake or Sandstone above. Uh, so, uh, so we kind of didn't really have explanation where this age zircons came from. And uh, the reason is uh, because if uh, there are people like Condi and uh, a group of people uh, working on uh, distribution of zircon ages for time. So we go to, uh, uh, to river, modern rivers, collect uh, uh, sense and we date uh, detrital zircons because they give us some ideas what uh, magmatic events happen in the province. And so you can get this uh, sort of peaks uh, and uh, drops uh, in magmatic activity and you can link it to assembly of a continent, the orogenic event, or to uh, a sort of time when uh, magmatic intrusions uh, happen. And so uh, what's shown here is uh, with the red line is 2.3. So here's a record of granites. And you can see like you go through various continents, almost nothing happens here. Here's the trital record. Also, like most continents don't show it. Africa, there is a little bit of peak, but for the rest, uh, kind of not a lot happening except uh, it was emerging in South America. And yet, uh, that's the age they found in this glacial and sandstone to be relatively abundant. Uh, so again, to emphasize the significance of this age, here's a mantle plume events for a time uh, from record of Richard Ernst, uh, sort of a, a mantle plume guy uh, from Canada. And you can uh, go here and you see 2.45 and then you see 222, 
and not much happened in between. So, uh, so what actually led uh, Ken Condi to suggest that during this 230 million years was a shutdown of plate tectonics and shutdown of magmatic activities, so kind of everything stopped for 230 million years and that's why oxygen went up and then everything started again. So my student, a PhD student, did a work on detrital zircon, hafnium, and oxygen isotopes, and arguing that this interpretation is incorrect. But that's a separate story, uh, which I submitted to geology. Uh, so what is relevant for this story, that we find in um, zircons with ages that fit into this gap. And so where do we find it, and how do we find them? Uh, like uh, the problem with, uh, if you are a geochronologist, it's very easy to date granite. You collect uh, one kilogram of granite and you kind of dissolve uh, lunch or dinner, right? You already uh, made a major job. Like if you want to date uh, volcanics, it's more complicated. You need to find felsic volcanics that potentially might or might not contain zircons. Uh, and in some cases uh, you might uh, spent several days and at the end you did not accomplish anything. If you want to date sediments, you are in a worst case situation. So like w what is where to date? And we still developing the methods like how to date sediments. And it's a major struggle for sedimentary geochemists. Uh, so what uh, my collaborator from Australia, Birch Rasmussen, developed but he real, started to realize that shales are unique in their capability to preserve uh, tooths. So basically, shales are uh, very uh, sort of a, um, a low sedimentation rate environments where if you have some volcanic event anywhere and you drop to this uh, volcanic tooth where it will not be reworked and it can be preserved as a millimeter thick uh, layer. And with modern geochronology, he is capable to date in situ with uh, tooth beds, which are on a scale of several millimeters thick. And with this capability, he can provide edge constraints uh, for uh, sedimentary succession. So what did we date here? This is basically a a thin tooth bed with maybe half a centimeter in sandstone uh, or in sandy layer. And how does he recognize that it's tooth? You see this platy quartz grains that reminiscent of volcanic quartz. Uh, you, so, uh, you look for embayment in quartz and this kind of features. So what did he find? That uh, uh, again, we get at the top of coronium after the three glacials and after the rise of atmospheric oxygen, we find this 2.3 billion years uh, age. Uh, okay, so um, uh, I now switch a little bit gears to something uh, that may be probably less familiar to you uh, in terms of, it's a recent tool developed uh, to constrain the rise of atmospheric oxygen. So what, uh, uh, since 2000, uh, uh, thanks to James Farquhar, what we started to realize that sulfur isotopes have a unique signature that we can link to photochemical processes in the atmosphere. And uh, so that's, uh, um, uh, and that opened us a window to use it as a trace uh, for oxidation of atmosphere. So I will go quickly over it, uh, and I'll try not to uh, bug you into technical details of it. But basically, um, sulfur has a four stable isotopes. And normally, we measure ratio of uh, most abundant. It's like uh, uh, you don't want, uh, unless necessary, to be backed uh, into doing complicated things, unless it gives you some advantage. So if you're a geochemist, uh, most abundant things that 
that's what you want to go after. And 32 is the most abundant isotopes, and 34 is next one. So that's what have been measured for decades and decades, and there are a lot of records for it. The ratio of 32 to 33 uh, was measured in early days by Henry Todd and others, and they realized that uh, in most cases, you can basically uh, calculate it from ratio of 34 to 32, and so uh, considering that it's techno uh, technologically more complicated to do these measurements, people stopped measuring it for a long time because it requires a certain instrumentation and certain uh, it requires fluorination. And fluorine is not something that people uh, keen to play with unless they really have to. What, uh, but uh, community working on meteorites continued to do these measurements because they suspected that some processes in uh, outer space can produce uh, some fractionations that would not follow this pattern. And so coming from this meteorite community, uh, people kind of uh, thought, what if we try to use uh, this fractionation as a trace uh, for oxygen in atmosphere? And I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, so uh, we express uh, sort of isotope values in terms of delta notation, but don't worry about it. And basically, uh, it allows us to, to see a very minor deviations from abundances of the standard, which in our case is kind of the blue trend. And so uh, the reason why people didn't, mention, didn't measure uh, ratio of 33 to 36 because everything is plot on this line and if you already measured this value you can measure uh, just uh, multiply and get value and it, it fits to terrestrial fractionation line, it fits to equilibrium fractionation line, it fits to biological fractionation line so unless you have a specific project in mind there is no reason to measure it except but it turned out that arcane uh, sedimentary sulfides and sulfates do not fit on this predicted line. They would, if you measure all isotopes, they would sit away from this line. Okay? And uh, that was a major discovery. And the way it was uh, explained is that in early days, in a lack of uh, oxygen and atmosphere, UV radiation could penetrate much deeper into our atmosphere and could produce this photochemical fractionation that people observe in the lab, so you can do it, uh, it's not something like uh, people making up, uh, you can uh, induce this photochemical fractionation in the lab, where might not exactly repeat what we see in geological record, but it's understandable because what you produce in the lab is uh, uh, kind of you uh, you're trying to repeat uh, natural environments, and you obviously cannot account for all conditions. But uh, uh, there are strong evidence that it's reflect photochemical fractionation, and so will be. Uh, photochemical fractionation in atmosphere and when it will be delivered to the earth and buried uh, as a sulfate and uh, pyrite with sediments. So uh, not to bother you too much with details,